um, or the, the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, which hears appeals from administrative agencies. Um, and those have, most of them have 20 some odd justices on them who sit in panels of three to decide cases. They still have a heavy caseload. Um, so I think one way to ameliorate that, that's why Congress given power to create inferior tribunals. So you can create intermediate appellate courts that settle many of these cases. Uh, Ju Chief Justice John Roberts recently did an interview, um, which I'd suggest students watch. I think it's a great introduction to the court and its function. Uh, it's in the C-SPAN video library. It's about a 45 minute interview. But in the midst of that, he makes the point that the Supreme Court's not a court of error. Many of those, many of the intermediate courts of appeals, you know, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals is a court of error. That is, it's there to try to correct errors that happen in trials. The Supreme Court is not that sort of court. It's a constitutional court. It's concerned with settling disputes or questions which have implications beyond the case at hand. Implications that are important to our system of government. Sometimes they sound rather mundane, like labor disputes, um, <laughs> antitrust cases. Sometimes they're of great significance. Uh, sometimes they're cases you know, often involving free speech or uh, as recently was decided, um, the presidential removal power or something that has real implications for our system. And I think the Supreme Court plays that role for a reason. In fact, uh, I, I honestly think um, that extending the court's caseload beyond 100 cases would probably be a mistake. It wouldn't allow them to be as selective and it wouldn't allow them to devote the kind of time that they do to each case. And I think that's important for our system. Because insofar as we have a debate over our theory of government and over our constitution that is really a principled and deliberative debate, it generally happens in the Supreme Court's opinions and the separate opinions that are written with those. And I'd hate to lose the quality of those that would come with an increase in the court's caseload. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The, um, the account of the debates of the Constitutional Convention that you give makes it seem as if the judicial review, the idea of judicial review is essentially an assumption that these people are coming in there. It is, yes. And it, this, this seems like a plausible account, but what I'm curious about is where this assumption comes from. I mean, I, I am not a constitutional scholar, but from what I know about history, I'm not sure where these guys pulled this out of the air. I mean, the only thing they can remotely relate to it is the history of common law in English jurisprudence. But I, yeah, there's a famous common law case decided by Lord Chief Justice Coke in England. Um, Dr. Bonham's case was it. Uh, the common law had a remedy like judicial review, but it was, it, it was not quite the same. What the common law remedy did was it looked at the application of a statute. And if the statute produced absurd consequences in a particular case, the court would merely decline to apply the law to that case. The law still stood as legitimate and applied to all other cases, but they'd simply set it aside in the particular case to provide relief on the assumption that were the legislature to examine this case, they would see the absurdity of the outcome of their general rule. This is the same thing that happens with equity jurisdiction and other things, it's largely what the common law does. This is obviously far different and no court in England has ever done anything like this. It emerged largely in the American context, and it emerged uh, as much as some uh, early opponents of federal power wanted to claim from the fact of written constitutions. The fact that we had written constitutions, which we presumed to be authoritative until changed, that is, they operated on the basis of tacit consent, um, required that there be some sort of oversight, and Americans more and more looked to courts of law to do that. Uh, I think at least five states had judiciaries that had asserted the power of judicial review by the 1780s. Um, so it emerges in the state courts, uh, is exercised more and more by them, and by 1787 it's largely accepted within the legal profession uh, that this is a legitimate consequence of a written constitution. Uh, there were different justifications for it, by the way. Hamilton in Federal 78 argues for it from popular sovereignty. That is, the judges are enforcing the will of the people expressed in their constitution over against the will of their representatives in the legislature. The constitution being the more considered, considered and direct act of the people. Um, there are other justifications for it, which I won't 
bore you with. But um, I would suggest uh, Gordon Wood, the Creation of the American Republic, uh, provides a pretty good summary of some of the sources of this, including how it connects to the common law and things, but it really was a distinctive institution. Um, any questions? Can I come back to yes. the, the question that Adrian raised? When Adrian used that phrase, an activist court. Now, I'm assuming in agreeing with his characterization of that, you're defining activist court or you're defining activism in terms of the scope of the court, yeah. right? In terms of the scope of the court's authority mm -hmm. over legislation or executive action yeah. to review it. Not necessarily the approach to constitutional interpretation that one applies, because in the more common lexicon, judicial activism is associated with a particular reading of the Constitution that expands upon as liberally as possible, right, particularly the rights of individuals. Um, I hope this doesn't get me lynched, but I'm going to quote Robert Bork. Um, <laughs> Because he really is a smart guy. Uh, he's wrong about some things, but he's really quite bright legal scholar. You should read his antitrust work. Uh, it's fundamental. Any law student has to read it, I'm pretty sure, if you study antitrust. Um, but Bork said in his Senate hearings, they asked him, would, would, he be a would he be a restraintist, basically? And he said, well, that kind of depends. Um, it depends on, and of course, then in that context, activists meant willing to overturn previous decisions of the court and to reach into new areas of case law. And he said, well, it depends on the cases that come before the court. If a case comes up and the Constitution requires a change in the case, then I'm going to be activist. <laughs> if a case comes up and the Constitution has nothing justiciable to say about it, then I'm going to be a restraintist, which was another way of saying you know, nobody is really a pure restraintist or activist. Um, I think if you look at most of that debate, which took place in the 70s and 80s, largely in the 80s, uh, it was a, uh, that was a red herring, the activist restraintist thing. Um, really, it was how much stuff do I want changed in constitutional law? If I want a lot of it changed, I'm an activist. Well, once you've changed it, then you're going to become a restraintist, right? Uh, it just depends on the current state of the law and what the courts are doing. So I, I, that's part of what the dis, my dissertation does. It gets past this activist restraint question. It says, what's the judicial role? Once we figure out what its institutional role is, then we can say in a particular case, the judiciary should address that. Or no, the judiciary shouldn't because it's just not part of their job. And I don't have an easy answer for that. In fact, my, my dissertation intentionally leaves out substantive questions. I'm not going to tell you whether pornography is free speech or not. I don't know. I, I just don't address it. It's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned to this question. I think first comes the institutional question. Then comes the substantive ones. And I think a lot of the scholarship has it the other way around. What outcome do I want and how can I come up with a justification for it? And I frankly think outcome-based constitutional law, particularly on institutional questions, is just not very helpful. Um, because once you form the solution and you get past that set of facts that is 20 years from now, that set of facts doesn't exist anymore. We've still got the institutional construction you gave us, and it's going to wreak havoc in some other area. Uh, you need a stable construction of institutional powers that will operate no matter who wins the presidency. Um, I'm saying that, I mean, you know, I started this, the work on this when George Bush was president, and I'm still doing it now that Obama's president, and I haven't changed my opinion. So, and it really doesn't matter to me who they put on the court as far as what I'm going to recommend here. Uh, and I think that's, I'd like to praise myself and say that's a more principled way of going about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your take on like the immigration law and the part there that Ask me, which one are we talking about? <laughs> this is the, we're going to put something on the birth certificate indicating they're not really American citizens? Oh, I see. Um, the question of whether federal law enforcement or whether state and local law enforcement ought to be enforcing immigration law is, I think, fundamentally a political question. Um, now, it depends. Obviously, there are ways in which you could go about scrutinizing someone that would violate their constitutional rights to, you know, under the Fourth Amendment, for instance. Um, 
I don't think that you can just ask somebody because they have an accent, you know, where they were born. Um, unless, of course, you're just curious and you're being nice. Uh, which most cops aren't. Uh, so, like, here's the thing. Um, I think that's ultimately a political question, and I'd be happy to give my two cents on it, though I don't know if everybody else really wants to hear it. Um, <laughs> you want to hear it? Oh, we want to hear it. Uh, okay, th this is not the authoritative statement of Baylor University or associated with them in any sense, <laughs> way, shape, or form. Um, Texas Lutheran University does not endorse this opinion. Uh, no, I, I think it's generally a bad idea to have local law enforcement doing it. I think the federal government's doing a bad job of enforcing immigration laws, and I think to shove it off on local law enforcement or for local law enforcement to assume that duty is problematic because I live in a neighborhood where I am by far in the minority. Uh, in fact, I am one of two white people in my neighborhood. Um, and the fact is, I know there are some folks living in my neighborhood who are illegal, illegal aliens. Um, and we had some robberies last year that didn't go reported. And the reason they didn't want to report the robberies is because they had illegal aliens living in their house. Now, I'm sensitive to the argument that, well, they're breaking the law and, you know, so what if they get caught? Fine. But I don't want people living in my neighborhood who aren't reporting robberies because then people are getting away with committing violent crimes within the vicinity of my family. And I don't, I'm just afraid that doing this will discourage illegal aliens from informing the police about the commission of crimes that should be investigated. That provides more incentive and more opportunity for people to victimize these folks and the people around them. Um, I think that's a serious problem. That may, you may be able to overcome that. I mean, you could make rules that said, well, you can't inquire about a person's residency or you know, legal status while investigating a crime, though that has problematic aspects too. Um, you know, you, you wanna be able to ask a drug dealer, hey, you, uh, are you legally here? <laughs> um, you, know, you don't really wanna prohibit the police from doing that. So it doesn't have an easy answer. I think the best answer is the federal government start doing its job. But we have a Congress who has no incentive to actually get it done because it's going to cost somebody a seat. You have an institution that's not nationally accountable, which indicates to me that the president should just take the initiative. Thank you so much oh. for being with us today. Yes, thank you.